I mean, it's almost impossible not to chair dance and like shuck a little bit when you're hearing that test car happy hour uh, uh, music come on. It's been Welcome, so long everybody. since I did one of these that I've never heard that before. And I was very confused when it started up. Pretty good, right? Kyle composed that himself. Uh, it's, well done it's to all Kyle. Midi. <laughs> I, that's, I made that up. He got it from the library somewhere. But I like, to, I like to throw out as many props as possible to producer Kyle, who's been the busiest man in show business and automotive show business this week, uh, trying to pull together all of the video assets for a very exciting week next week, where we're going to be talking an awful lot on motorone.com about the motorone.com star awards. Yay. Huzzah. Uh, but before we get to that, welcome everybody to, uh, uh the motorone.com test car happy hour. I'm going to break a land speed record for saying motorone.com, uh, today. Joining me as as ever is uh, Brett Evans, our regular guest, and Brandon Turkis, our erstwhile managing editor, who's been traipsing around Europe yet again, driving uh, fancy cars and, and generally enjoying life. Most um, <laughs> glad to have all you all of you following along. Uh, let me just remind you, this is a live podcast, and we fully encourage uh, uh, reader and and viewer involvement. If you have questions, comments, uh, anything that you'd like us to know, whether you're watching us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, uh, please leave a comment wherever you are. We will flash it up on the screen if we think it's great. We'll love to answer it and extend the conversation to you all. Um, how did? Let, let's just start with, uh, the, it's been a minute since we've all been together and talked. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? We're, we're turkey days, and, and in Turks' case, pie days. Enjoyed black, by all. Black Pie Day, man. You can't you can't say no to Black Pie Day. <laughs> what were the featured pies on Black Pie Day today or this well, year? Pumpkin, naturally. Uh, you can't mm. do Black Pie Day without pumpkin pie, and then Dutch apple. Ooh, yeah. As the as the Motor One's resident Dutchman, I, I applaud the Dutch apple <laughs> and the streusel on the top. How about you, Brett? Uh, would you guys be so offended to know that I didn't have a single slice of pie on Thanksgiving Day? Deeply, deeply offended. I we I'm had a we had it a, just hurts my heart. I know mine too. We went to my we went to my probably folks. actually good for your heart to be honest. I mean, <laughs> there were there were twenty seven people at our Thanksgiving dinner this year, and so there was just like so much going on that I like finished my food. Went and played with the dogs outside, came inside, forgot pie even existed. It was insane. And then the next day, it was like, I need all the pie and only the pie is all I will be eating today. So. How do you forget the pie exists? The pie is the reason for, for like being there. I know. I know, Brandon. Like This has been my existential crisis for a full week now. I mean, let's just make sure that you're heavy up on pie for the rest of the holiday season to make up for that that obvious lapse. Um, there you go. And, and, and call it good. But... Um, How about you, tall man? How was your Thanksgiving? It was fun. It was fun. It was a lot of driving, a lot of seeing family. I, I uh, was traipsing across all of Michigan, uh, enjoying my other tall relatives and my small family in, what were we driving? Oh, we were driving, a, we, we thought about, we tried to have a Thanksgiving, what are we driving for Thanksgiving episode of the Motor One uh, Happy Hour, but we weren't able to pull it off because of the holiday, unfortunately. And I was driving a very nice Genesis G80 sedan, uh, uh, putting, putting my two small children and my wife and all of our stuff in that car was no problem. Um, it's one that we've talked about on the happy hour before. I'll just bottom line it for you. Lovely driving experience, roomy, uh, pretty much everything that I could have wanted other than, you know, I can, I could pick some nits with like the infotainment uh, system and stuff like that, but it was really good. So, um, but that was that was a week before. We will not recap the driving week that was uh, two weeks ago. That was, and instead, let's let's get to the cars that we've been driving this week. Uh, and we we're going to start with EQS, but we've got a, our old friend EKG Canadian enthusiast weighing in asking about the CX50. So maybe we'll talk about the car that I've been driving first. The question is: uh, it, New Mazda CX50 is a very good vehicle, but based on its perform sorry performance, exterior design, interior design. And others, it has not met the hypes at hype, so it's no match for Lexus, Genesis, or the Germans. There's a lot to unpack there, but as ever, uh, Canadian enthusiasts has set about set us up for a conversation. So, I will say about a week into driving it, I agree for sure. It's not 
if, if there was any confusion about the new CX-50 competing with premium brands head to head, I would say that that's done and dusted, right? Any, any argument here from you guys who've been in, in, well, in this car? The Mazda, I, I don't really understand what, and I'm probably not going to win any fans for saying this. I don't really understand what's going on at Mazda. They, they, in the past, you know, three or four years, they've, they've gotten this, you know, we're, we're an aspirational luxury brand We're you know, the CX 30 challenges the, the Mercedes GLA and the CX 50 is a GLC competitor. And it's, it's, it's a nice car. It's, it's not a luxury vehicle. Um, no matter how much you you say it's a luxury vehicle as an automaker, that doesn't make it so. It's a, it's a nice SUV or a nice crossover. I enjoyed driving it when I had it. Um, I think it looks fantastic. Pictures really don't do it justice. It has, mm -hmm. especially in in this shade of paint. Seth, you have the same. Uh, I think it's called Zircon Sand. Yep, that's right. Yep, the same color that I had. And it's kind of the the hero color for the CX fifty. Um, it looks fantastic and, and the interior looks very nice and well designed. Um, I felt material quality was pretty mediocre. I think the infotainment is actively terrible. Um, and the powertrain just isn't as refined as what you'd get, or, or the ride quality for that matter isn't as refined as what you would get on a Lexus or a Genesis or a Mercedes or BMW or Audi. Um, but it is, it is a very nice car for what it is. I just, I, I don't really understand the messaging on Mazda's part there. I was kind of waiting for you to bring up re powertrain refinement with regard to like Mercedes specifically, because their four cylinder is not particularly refined. So I, I don't, I don't think it's a luxury car at all. I don't think it's as far off as we like to pretend it is. I think, I think they do a very good job of making their commodity cars look very premium and it's still a commodity brand. They're not, they're not, they're not a luxury but, brand. I told them, I don't disagree at all, but I think they're closer than some of us like to admit. I mean, Seth, the I, car I, you have is like 43 grand or something like that. Like it's not cheap. 41, 620. Yeah. For the car that I have, which is, uh, which is the Meridian version. Right. So, and actually like we should get into this because I was perusing your review of the non Meridian edition CX 50 Brandon. And, I actually think that it, it maybe is like money extremely poorly spent to throw that on this car. Like I'm, I'm really curious about driving the standard CX 50 now because for, for all intents and purposes, like the, the, what, what I'm getting is like a little bit of body cladding, butched up looks, um, slightly knobbier tires. I mean, it's not really fair to call them off-road tires, but they're, they're definitely not, you know, they're, they're biased towards, call it like so, non-paved surfaces gravel and things like that and some pretty uh unremarkable like hood hood stripes and badging right that, so i mean that that's the thing like i don't really understand how you know it's a premium product but we're gonna do this vaguely off-road thing it seems like mazda is just throwing approaches at the wall and praying that something sticks yeah i think that the the CX-50, like, as a as a, a vehicle line, I think is is really interesting. Yeah, there are the graphics. It's a little bit hard. I couldn't, I couldn't quite get it. It's sort of ghosted out, the CX-50 and Meridian edition, but you guys can see it. I brought this – I drove this to meet a friend. Uh, we went and, and uh, saw a speaker a couple of nights ago, and and he was asking about it. And, you know, kind of, as you pointed out, Brandon, thought it was an attractive vehicle. And then he saw the, the stuff on the hood, and he was like, wait, can I get it without this? And I'm like, yeah, in fact, you can. You can spend less money and get that. But to me, this is – and I'm talking specifically about the Meridian edition. I think that Mazda is really trying to get a bite of like what Subaru has been doing for a while. And, and we'll talk a little bit um, about the, uh, the trail sport too, right? The, pi or, uh, uh, not pilot, but passport, <laughs> I'm passport, trail sport, right? Which I think is maybe a more credible version of this idea that we've talked about a lot in the past, a slightly more rugged, slightly off-road version of a standard crossover. I think that there's some merit to that idea and there's certainly some proof that people want to buy these things, but Mazda's version of it to me is um, the ride quality is not great. I agree a little bit with the, the, the engine itself is actually quite good. I think like it's, the, you know, we're talking about 300 pound feet of torque. Um, it's not bad on the highway. The powertrain refinement is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's all right. It, it, it's not, not really remarkable to me one way or the other. But the ride quality on these tires is bad, right? Like it's not that quiet inside. And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about over, you know, some of our favorite crossovers, you know, like Honda's got a new CRV. The Kia Sportage is very good. Um, you know, like Subaru is still doing this, a better version of this exact vehicle. 
the competition in this size class and body style is the most bloodthirsty in the entire industry right now. So for Mazda to come out and sort of lean on, it looks cool and it's a little bit butched up to me is kind of cynical. And well, I'll be honest, you guys, this is like the first time that I've gotten in a Mazda product like on day one. I can't remember the last time where I wasn't like, oh, this is a little better than I expected. Mazda usually really like hits it out of the park with me. I like what they do from a driving di- dynamic standpoint. And and this one has been um, less than, I've been less than enthusiastic about it overall. So yeah, that, going, going back to what I was saying, like they, they're trying to be a luxury brand, but then they're trying to do this. And it seems like they're just going in so many different directions and all of them are kind of coming up short. Um, Here's the thing, though, but I'm, but I'm, I'm also, I'm also, I'm also fiercely loyal to the, you know, the Mazda of 2010, 2011, 2012, when the three was excellent. The CX five had just come out and the six was fantastic. And, you know, that's just that, that memory of the brand has kind of gone away over the past few years. I just don't think they have anything to lose though, because they, they don't have that huge of a, uh, that huge of a brand like they don't have a, a lot of, they don't make a lot of sales and i don't think they're ever going to be a honda or a toyota competitor as long as they're still an independent manufacturer so i don't really think that there's a problem with them just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks like you know i, I canadian enthusiast agrees with you brandon um everyone, everyone should agree with me everyone should agree with me thank you ekg <laughs> I just like I don't think that there's really that big of a it's that big of a deal. I I don't there's nothing that about the CX50 that offends me in any way, and so I think it's fine that they're kind of trying something new and trying out you know different versions of different versions of premium. You know, I will say the 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 big issue that I had with it when when I drove it is everything in it felt very tinny. Um, you open the doors and like mm-hmm. let the handle go back, and it, and there's like a loud metallic yeah. clang, and I had like sounds coming from the sunroof every time i shut one of the doors and it just it it didn't That's fair. it didn't feel especially well built even though the material quality was was quite high and very attractive yeah that's fair yeah the 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 bag on mazda for as long as i can remember has been yes the build quality doesn't i'm talking about feel i'm not talking about anything measurable right now i'm saying right. when you shut a door when you when you move a gear lever and things like that that stuff doesn't feel as fundamentally sound as maybe the other japanese competitors and and occasionally like a sort of one off great american uh, competitor in the segment right but the trade off has been yeah but they're doing that because the vehicle's lighter the, the like there's more p- attention paid to um, uh, suspension tuning and response and they're g- great to drive so some of the practical stuff, you lose 10% of practicality and you get 10% of enthusiasm as a, as a result. And I think that's a fair trade for a lot of people. I don't feel that way so far with this vehicle, but I'm also like, I'm, I'm holding fire a little bit because I know that I'm on bad tires for what I want to do. And in an expensive package that, for, that I'm paying for stuff that I don't really care about with this particular car. So um, all that being said, and cause, cause we should move on to, but uh yeah, I, I do think that the cabin quality is nice. I think that somebody who hasn't had a new car for a while or hasn't been in a new car for a while might get in this. The ex- the eyeball in the exterior is great. The interior is like looks really nice. And I think only the case really, really starts to fall apart if you're truly cross shopping because this segment, again, to, to underline it, is extremely good right now. <laughs> like there's there are some really, really fantastic yeah. vehicles. That, That's the thing. I, I just I just don't see a world where I would buy this over a over an outback. I mean, right. Well, why don't we talk about whether or not we'd buy it, buy it over a trail sport since, since we uh, have already previewed that. This is kind of a, kind of a compelling question because I didn't realize your, your car was that expensive. Mine was, let me look at the Monroney right now. Mine was 44,600 with a fancy coat of paint. So you're getting a lot more space for sure. If you go for a passport over a, uh, over a CX 50, um, you know, you're probably losing losing out on your quality isn't phenomenal. It doesn't look great. It looks a little dated for sure. But um, it is a hugely comfortable and uh, spacious vehicle. I took this one on a, a road trip this last week, and we covered about 1,800 miles, and it was amazing. I mean, I, I, will, I will go on record saying that I think that the seats in the current Passport Ridgeline Pilot, the front seats, are some of the best seats in the industry, in spite of the fact that they only like wow. adjust six or seven ways, like I, I just was fine after 
eight hours each day in the seat, I was totally fine. So big ups for the passport on that one. Um, I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, definitely a lot of, it's an old product, you know, old bones, old, old engine architecture, stuff like that. There's definitely some things that you can, some complaints that you can levy at it for that. But I, I honestly came uh -huh. away pretty impressed. Yeah. There's my dog in the back seat of the passport, just derping around. So yeah, we had, a, we had a great trip. It was a really good time. We had plenty of space for, you know, for me and my boyfriend and the dog and all of our stuff. It was, it was good. I was very surprised at how much I enjoyed that car at the end of the trip. In a, on a day-to-day -day sense, Brett, are you getting something with the trail sport package that matters to you? Or is it, is it a lot more about like looks and kind of the vibe or this, this is where your cynicism about the, uh, the CX 50 rings really true for me about the trail sport, because mm -hmm. I think you do get like 0 0.6 inch of added ground clearance but those tires are actually highway tires. They're they're reskinned. The sidewall has been reskinned to make them look like all-terrain tires, but it's just a highway tire. Um, you don't really get any huh. special electronics or technology um, in terms of like. But it says know, the, trail the, sport on the seats, right? Like that's yeah, important. Like really, everybody knows seat. you're every yeah. ever. The important thing is everyone knows you're driving a trail sport. Right. Yeah. Totally. No, I'm I'm really interested to see what the next generation passport trail sport is going to look like because. You know, we saw the we saw the pilot trail sport debut a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and it actually has some, you know, like the rear differential is distinct, like it actually sends power in a different way to the rear wheels. And there's more um, added ground clearance. The springs and, and stabilizer bars are unique for that car to give you more articulation. Like they actually give it some genuine hardware improvements. I, this is literally just a, uh, a passport with some fancy some fancy wheels some fancy stitching and a uh, and a very slight lift I will, so I will I'll say, be interested to see you you make a good point about pilot because and just to add a little bit to that i'm actually attending the first drive of that vehicle in at the end of january or middle of january and one of the things they asked specifically about in the invitation is what level of off-road experience i have so i have hmm. a feeling they're really going in um on the off-roading in that vehicle which is which is exciting and interesting and i mean honda uh, you know forgive me if i'm if i'm totally off base here but i don't think it has like as a brand a huge history of off-roading it's not a subaru it's not a toyota um it's it's not even a nissan so you know this, that they're kind of embracing that with the trail sport badge and really like expanding the range and adding the hardware in future products is is very very exciting to me well, this is kind of what Nissan did with the Rock Creek Pathfinder because the previous generation Rock Creek was literally badging. There was nothing. Oh, this special new one is it. so cool. This new, the new and, Rock Creek is so cool. And it, yeah, it actually has some like legitimate upgrades. And I, I kind of wonder if, I hope that that I don't get in trouble for saying this, but I kind of wonder if they had waited to bring the Trail Sport badge out till there were actually some hard, like some hardware and and mechanical improvements. I think they may have diluted their brand already by just trotting it out on this on this generation passport well, instead of waiting I, until the pilot. I think that's a totally fair criticism and one I pretty much agree with. It's but I'll be, I'll be Honda, when right? you get done with that drive in a couple of weeks. I'll be really interested to hear if you actually uh, did any hardcore wheeling in the pilot. If you did, that'll be that'll be pretty cool. The last I, time yeah. anyone went off roading in a passport was when the passport was actually an Isuzu rodeo. So <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say the last you asked like whether or not uh, Honda has any off-road potential. That was the first vehicle that popped into my mind and that's been that's been gone for quite some time. But I, I guess my point of view on this is it's not, you know, th there there can be and have been very valid criticisms against more specialized vehicles that Honda has made in the past, but it's rarely because they're cynical, right? It's ra rarely this sort of like badging. It's mostly because they tend to be pretty conservative and say like, what do people really need versus what they think they need? And then they engineer products like the Ridgeline that they think is this really clever solution to what a truck owner really needs versus what they, the perception of what they need. And the reality is, well, that's just not a, always a smart marketing play because, um, even if they're right, they're wrong, right? Even if right. they're right, that's not what people want to buy. So for to to hear that passport trail sport is you know like really more show than go off road is disappointing and also to me doesn't like track with what they've done um, with other sort of engineering problems in the past. So yeah, I I, I sincerely hope that the new one is um, more legit and more fun. 
Well, and not to belabor the point too much, it is still a solid family SUV. Like, still sure. the the torque vectoring system. It's a true torque vectoring all-wheel drive system, and it has been since twenty two thousand nine, I think. And so it actually does route power to the wheels that need grip the most. And so like that's that's very impressive for a car that is like arguably you know supposed to be like a like a snow belt car and nothing more. So it does actually yeah. like just inherently it has some decent you know, rough road capability. It's just that the trail sport badge doesn't really add that much to that already solid base. And it would be nice if it did. And it will, it will. in you know, in a few weeks as we'll hear Brandon tell us, I'm sure. Yep. Um, all right, Brandon, on to you. The most that uh, we, we've sort of, we thought we were going to start with this one and then, and then buried a little bit, but um, just, just you your, <laughs> your new, your new favorite EQ product or just an improvement over the EQS? Um, first of all what are you driving and then and then you can answer the question <laughs> so i'm 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 right in the middle of like a really crazy <laughs> a string of mercedes i was in on eqs amg over thanksgiving i just got back from driving the c63 amg which i can't tell any of you about and now i'm in the eqs Ooh. suv um which is i'm i'm very pleasantly surprised by the 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 standard eqs sedan is a vehicle that um critically i think like or objectively i think is is quite good it's very comfortable it is a pleasant to drive but i've never really cared for it especially the standard version the amg is kind of a different story um but it, this vehicle this platform feels so much more natural as an suv it almost feels like mercedes came out with the the eqs sedan first um simply get to give deference to to s badge sedans that you know um are very important to the brand but it feels like it, all of this was designed deliberately with suvs in mind and the eqs suv i mean it's it's so much roomier it is ingress and egress is easier it, everything in the cabin feels better proportioned um positioning of things like the instrument cluster and um the, the massive hyper screen, they, they, it all feels a little bit more natural. You get into a standard EQS sedan and everything just feels a little bit off. Like certain things are tilted just the wrong way. And the seating position is kind of odd. And I don't really experience that in, in the SUV. And frankly, I just think it looks a hell of a lot better. When I, when I picked this thing up from the airport yesterday, I was, I was it was the first one I've seen in person. I was very pleasantly surprised at, at how attractive it is. Um, yeah. Real quick, we've got Gary Clark weighing in here. This is interesting. So uh, first of all, hi, Gary. Thanks for joining again. And he says um, the EQE. So we're talking about EQS uh, SUV. He says the EQE SUV is legit off road. The reason that's interesting to me is because we had a first drive of that vehicle uh, done by a uh, uh, longtime friend and, and contributor now named Rex Roy. And it was I, I was interested by that article because he st like was on the first drive program. Mercedes clearly put people off in off road on off road trails with it, and he really kind of glommed on to the idea that it's very capable off road, despite the fact that I think a valid criticism would be yes, but literally nobody will ever drive it there. Yeah, um, yeah, EQS. I, right? I, EQS I, I think I think I think Mercedes knows this because, and if you go to Inside EVs right now, you'll find a first drive of the. EQG prototype. Actually, no, that is that on Motor One? I don't remember where that it's on Motor One. It's, on Motor One. <laughs> it's yep. on Motor One. Um yep. so I mean this this one is this one is capable in the same way off-road as a GLS is capable off-road. It has air suspension, sure. um, it has certain things it you know that that make it a little bit better. Um here's the thing the, that, that sets it apart the most though is the rear axle steering because we were, yeah. I mean, we were literally turning almost turning on on uh, the, the car's center line. It was insane. We were, we were able to make turns that I couldn't do in a short wheelbase uh, Wrangler. You know, it was nuts. So the wow. maneuverability wow. on that thing is off the charts. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's just a very, very nice electric SUV. Um, and it feels it feels so much more natural than the EQS. Um, I'm, I'm getting into EQE next week and I'm, I'm curious to see how, EQE sedan. And I'm curious to how, how I'll feel about that. My, my one, not, not, concern but this eqs suv eqs suv that i have is the 450 so it's um the base model with dual motors so all-wheel drive uh it starts at 107 four hundred seven thousand four hundred dollars um 
good in guy. a way 6,200 pounds with only 355 mm. horsepower and 590 pound feet of torque. Um, now I've only really driven it home from the airport and, and a little bit around town and I haven't been wanting for power. And I've, I've argued in the past that, uh, that more powerful versions of EVs are typically not a great value. I think it's the case here because the EQS 580 is 126 grand, but I am a little bit concerned about having that much mass and that little power in, especially if you're in like a freeway heavy environment. Um, but I get that's going to take more testing to figure out. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. I guess I don't know how it would perform fully loaded because I only ever drove it with just me and maybe one other passenger on board when the, when I did the first drive. But like we were we were in Colorado, so you know lots of hills, lots of like kind of just long, intense uphill slogs, and it was fine. Even the 450 was just fine. So I'll I'll be curious to see if you have any issues with it in your week. But I kind of agree. I think most most up like more powerful versions of EVs are tend to be overkill. I think you'll, I think you'll find it's pretty good. Yeah. Especially, especially, you know, the, the performance badges, if there's an M badge or an, an AMG badge, it's uh, yeah, it, it's not, a, not typically a, the, the value that it once was. Um, but yeah, overall, I just, I, I love the packaging on this thing. I think it's, I think it's really great. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to spend the rest of the week with it. Is yours a four, uh, five seater or a seven seater? that i need to dive into my suitcase is still in the back and i think it's a five seater because i didn't see any cut lines for the third row of seats um i i I would not be surprised if there were not a great many us suv seven seaters in in the press fleet i'm kind of wondering if that's going to be like the elusive uh glb seven seater i wonder because i mean their their whole shtick is that it has the same footprint and the same you know uh, I think it's like the same shadow as a as a GLS, and so their whole deal is like, yes, this is a seven seat SUV. The third row seats are terrible. I mean, they are mm-hmm. like it's like the Nissan Rogue's third row from a few generations ago. Like they're they are so tiny, and I yeah, I think it definitely works best as a as a dedicated five seater with my, the added cargo capacity and stuff. Mind you, all I've done is thrown a suitcase in the back, but I, I did the same thing with EQS. That was the last thing I did was take a suitcase out with EQS AMG sedan. And then the first thing I did with this was throw a suitcase into the trunk. And you know it's it's from memory, but the the cargo capacities there in terms of like the floor don't seem all that different. Um mm, interesting. So I'm, I might have to break out a tape measure or see if I can look up a spec sheet that has that info, but it doesn't yeah. seem terribly capacious. Yeah, it's it's know. always interesting too, like that those small third rows. I think you really break down. I was having this conversation just the other night with a friend of mine who's got um, two kids a little bit older than mine, and he's looking for a new vehicle, and was talking a lot about like his wish list is a vehicle that has that is three rows with a three wide third row but captain's chairs available in the second row and like so he's we buying a three row gm gm suv basically no because the, the gm suvs are too long for his garage so he needs something a class down from put him no, in the pathfinder I, that's what i yeah, said i said the pathfinder. pathfinder but i couldn't remember if the pathfinder is a three row or or the sportage or sportage as well does or, the sportage or, have three across or is it two not sportage um well, sorrento sorrento uh Tell you, yeah, yeah. Tell your ride and and um, um, what's the other one. So are, I, are, are, I think both good options. But I have I have some bad news for your friend. Um, he yeah. needs a minivan. No, I know, and he knows that. But he, this is a, like, like just what? just just give in, man. You you chose to have <laughs> kids. Just give in. But the, the the point here is that like I think it's it's really interesting when you talk about these sort of you know the one that always springs to mind for me is the is the Outlander right that is historic like forever had like that super dinky uh, third row and they always defend it by saying yeah you don't I mean you don't have to buy it that way but if you buy it that way it's because you have a real need for it and if you have a real need for it you have a real need for it right and like especially when it comes to like seating positions and number of seats and uh, flexibility of use like every buyer is kind of a fingerprint you know they have. Everybody has a really, really specific way that they want to use their vehicle. It makes the the breakdown of available options completely interesting. So he, Gary said he needs a miracle, which is uh, probably That's correct. Fair too. Let's go back a little bit because I, I think we were I think that we were talking a lot interchangeably a little bit about the EQS and the upcoming EQG, right? Mm-hmm. When when 
when Gary asked, are the video clips honest tank turns? And I assume he was talking about the EQG and not yeah, the S there. He, he's, okay. Yeah, that's not a feature on the S. If it were, I'd okay, be doing okay. them all the time. I'd still be out there right that now. That would be very tank. strange, but yeah. but completely awesome. And do we know the answer? Does the EQG have have true? I guess I don't I don't know how to even break this down. Like I mean, what is the, a true tank turn and what is not a tank turn uh, is where if I'm if I'm understanding it right, where drive side tires are the yeah. tires are everything is yeah. turning and then some of them are turning in opposite directions yeah it's it's just like a perfect rotation on the center line of the car where the front wheels are going or the, where the left wheels are going forward and the right wheels are going backward right so it's just right, like right. a perfect rotation like it's on a turntable yeah and, so I mean, the, all, the quick see, answer for me is i don't know whether or not the, the eqg will have a true tank turn I mean, the prototype. The prototypes have, and Mercedes has talked about it, um, and they would not be releasing video of it of of journalists doing it from that prototype drive, if it were not a thing that were coming to production. Um, right. So yeah, uh, I, that's going to be the, the you know you remember a few years ago when the the e- GLS added the the bouncy suspension thing for like escaping <laughs> from sand from sand. Mm-hmm. That's going to be the same thing. That's going to be like the new version of that. Um, yeah, Rivian. I, re- I remember that only from my Instagram. <laughs> Rivian uh, did some sorry, videos though. with the tank turn with a tank turn function on the. It wasn't that Rivian that did that, and then they announced it yeah. later that it wasn't actually going to make it to production. Do you remember that? I think that. Yeah, and I think Hummer did it too. I don't remember. Yeah, Hummer, sort of. That doesn't really happen. Well, well, because Hummer has crab walk, right? But it's not the exact same thing, right? right. And, I, and I want, I just wonder how, like, kind of port. Clearly, the technology is available to make a vehicle do it, right? The question becomes, what is the trade off that you get? And maybe some of these companies are finding that the trade off is too too much of an engine, uh, engineering sort of puzzle to solve. Um, whether it's I think it's more of a durability of, durability puzzle. I can't imagine that reliability on differentials. Yeah, exactly, and and. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, I'm sure that they've got to vet it for something that would never happen. Like, is somebody pulling out of a driveway where they need to do a tank turn it literally every day when they get in the vehicle? Seems unlikely, but, um, you know, I know that uh, automakers tend to be pretty conservative when when they're engineering, especially brand new hardware. They don't want it to break. My um, friend my friend lives in a building uh, that has like an, a carriage, road, a carriage turntable in the parking garage. And what you do is you drive onto the turntable, get out of your car, rotate your car 90 degrees, and then back up into your parking space. So this would just... So it's, is, it, is it like one of those things where it's like a like a, 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 a turntable and like a mining cart thing where it's like... <laughs> no, it's, it's this gigantic... It's literally a carriage house. It's this gigantic wooden turntable that's probably 25 feet across. And you drive your car onto it. And rotate your car so that it's pointing to your the the parking spaces are all in a like a arrayed in a circle, and you rotate it to your parking space and back up. Mercedes is designing the EQG for this for like these ten people in Los Angeles that live in this apartment. Building. That's all. The, <laughs> that's the whole use case. It's very exciting. Um, well, hopefully, let's let's do a quick pivot because we're over time. But hopefully, uh, we will have. I don't know, maybe an EQS, but and, and maybe an EQG available next year when we when we are ready to line up our vehicles for the Moto One Star Awards and the Inside EV Star Awards in 2023. Um, really, just awkward segue here, guys, and I apologize for it. But we <laughs> let off to the top. Um, we are we are launching a whole lot of stories. We are publishing a bunch of stories next week. We've got winners for the Motor One Star Awards coming at you starting Monday morning at 9 a.m. Um, we encourage you to go to the site. There are going to be a couple winners announced per day, uh, Monday through Thursday. And then Thursday, if you guys um, would be so kind, we would very much love to have you as guests for a live uh, podcast, very much like this one, where all of the editors and some friends are going to be around to announce our winner for the Editor's Choice Award of the 2002, 2022, or 2002. as Brett likes to say. 2022 motor1.com star awards apparently i'm old and i don't know how to say years anymore um yeah that's it anything else to add any other teasers there we can, we obviously can't tell you any winners what's the biggest let's say this we'll go around the room starting brandon what do you think people will be the most which award will people be the most surprised with in terms of a category which category I, I, winner will surprise them the most uh i don't know if i can say the the, the problem the problem is we've published what all the cars are what all the cars are competing and i'm pretty sure if i 
say what I'm thinking of, it's going to give away the game. Um, we have five five people watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this it's on yeah. the internet. It's going to live in perpetuity. Let's just start breaking embargoes right and left. There's only five yeah, people exactly. watching. Um, I, I can say that they're – let me put it like this. Some vehicles were more successful than other vehicles. Some vehicles were much more successful than, than other vehicles. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going to leave it at that. That's a good teaser. And then, okay, so, so then for you, Brett, how excited are you to be done producing Motor1.com Star Wars content for 2022? Wait a second. You should have asked me that. <laughs> I, so, that you should ask Brandon that because I feel like oh it was just God. a really fun time. I, I had a great week <laughs> and then I had a great two weeks writing stories. Like I uh, I could do this all day, man. Let's keep uh, going. Honestly, honestly, viewers, Star Wars has run my life for like the, the past two and a half months. <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. I you're asking the my wrong brain. Person. My brain started I drove potatoes. cool cars. I called it a day. It was great. Oh, it it was great, and it will be great. We're really excited about it next week. You guys should look for it on on both Motor One and Inside EVs. Like I said, we're going to be de debuting all of the winners. Um, we'll be giving some extra promotion love to the li like I said, the live stream that we'll be doing on Thursday. I believe it's at eight p.m. Eastern time. I will be in Europe attending this and probably awake at 2 a.m. or something like that trying to take place. So I'm, I'll am i be all over the place. Uh, really, it'll be great. Talk, talk about a Segway crash, Gary. And, and the exciting part is we... In, I was going to say, Spain. the exciting part is we still don't know where in Europe you're going to be. Could be it's Germany, real. could be Spain. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for, for watching. As ever, if you see this after the fact in the recorded version, thanks again for watching. Please feel free to leave us a comment or question and we'll answer it there. Uh, tune in with us every Friday at 4 o'clock or at least most Fridays at 4 o'clock uh, during the holidays as we talk about the cars we've been driving all week. Guys, thanks so much and we'll see you next week. Peace.